students about the companies that you like? I don't mean names. I mean what makes the company yeah. something that you like. I, like. I like businesses I can understand. We'll start with that. That narrows it down about 90%. I mean, uh, see, I, there's all kinds of things I don't understand, but fortunately, there's enough I do understand. And you got this big, wide world out there. Almost every company's publicly owned, so you got you got all American business practically available to you. Now, to start with, it doesn't make sense to go with things that you think you can understand, but you can understand some things. I can understand this. I mean, you can understand this. Anybody can understand this. I mean, this is a product that basically hasn't been changed much. They've added the cherry, uh, but you know, since 1880. Six or whatever it was, and it's a simple business. It's it's not an easy business. I don't want a business that's easy for competitors. So I want a business with a moat around it. I want a very valuable castle in the middle, and then I want to I want to I, I, I want the duke who's in charge of that castle to be honest and hardworking and able, and then I want a big moat around the castle, and that moat can be various things. The moat in a business like our auto insurance business at Geico is low cost. I mean, people have to buy auto insurance, so everybody's going to have an, one auto insurance policy per per car, basically, uh, or per driver. And and you, you, I can't sell them twenty, you know, but but they have to buy one. What are they going to buy it on? They're going to buy it on based on service and cost. Most people will assume the service is fairly uh, identical among companies or close enough, so they're going to do it on cost. So I got to be the low cost producer. That's my moat. To the extent I, my costs get further lower than the other guy, I've thrown a couple of sharks into the moat. You know? But all the time, if you've got a wonderful castle, there are people out there who are going to try and attack it and take it away from you. And I want a castle that I can understand, but I want a castle with a moat around it. Thirty years ago, Eastman Kodak's moat was, was just as wide as Coca-Cola's moat. I mean, if you were going to take a picture of your six-month-old baby, and you're going to want to look at that picture 20 years from now, and you're going to look at it 50 years from now, and you're never going to get a chance. I mean, you're not a professional photographer so that you can evaluate what's going to look good 20 or 50 years ago. What is in your mind about that, about that photography company is what counts because they are promising you that the picture you take today is going to be terrific to look at 20 or 30 or 50 years from now about something that's very important to you, maybe your own child or whatever it may be. Well, Kodak had that in spades 30 years ago. They owned that. They had what I call share of mind. Forget about share of market, share of mind. They had something in everybody's mind around the country around the world with a little yellow box and everything that said Kodak is the best. That's priceless. They've lost some of that. They haven't lost it all and, and not due to George Fisher who runs George is doing a great job. But they let that moat narrow. They let Fuji come and start narrowing the moat in various ways. They let them get into the Olympics and take away that special aspect that only only Kodak was fit to photograph the Olympics. So Fuji gets there and immediately in people's minds, Fuji becomes more at a parody with, with Kodak. You haven't seen that with Coke. Coke's moat is wider now than it was 30 years ago. You can't see the moat day by day, but every time you know, the infrastructure gets built in some country that isn't yet profitable for Coke but will be 20 years from now, the moat is widening a little bit. The things are all the time changing that moat in one direction or another. Ten years from now, you can see the difference. Our managers of the businesses we run, I've, I've got one message to them, you know, which is to widen the moat. And we want to we want to throw crocodiles and sharks and everything else, <laughs> gators, I guess, into the, into the moat to keep away competitors. And that that's, comes about through service. It comes about through quality of product. It comes about through cost. It comes about sometimes through patents. It comes about through real estate location. So that's the business I'm looking for. Now, what kind of businesses am I going to find like that? Well, I'm going to find them. I'm going to find them in simple products because I'm not going to be able to figure out what the moat's going to look like for Oracle or Lotus or Microsoft 10 years from now. I mean, I, uh, Gates is the best businessman I've ever run into, and you know they've got a hell of a position, but I really don't know what that business is going to look like 10 years from now. And I certainly don't know what his competitors' businesses are going to look like 10 years from now. Now, I'll name one I don't own. I know what the chewing gum business is going to look like from 10 years from now. I mean, the Internet is not going to change how we chew gum. It's, and, and nothing much else is going to change how we chew gum. And then are there going to be lots of new products? Is it really, you know, our spearmint and juicy fruit and all those going to evaporate? So it isn't going to happen. You give me a billion dollars and tell me to go in the chewing gum business and try and make a real dent in Wrigley's, I can't do it. And that's the way I think about businesses. I say to myself, Give me a billion dollars and how much can I hurt the guy? Give me ten billion dollars. Give me ten billion dollars and how much can I hurt Coca-Cola around the world? I can't do it. Well, those are good businesses. Now, give me some money and tell me to hurt somebody in, in some other fields and I can figure out how to do it. But, uh, so I want a simple business, easy to understand, great economics now, honest and able management, 
And, and uh, then I can see about in a general way where they're going to be 10 years from now. And if I can't see where they're going to be 10 years from now, I don't want to buy them. Basically, I don't want to buy any stock where if they close the New York Stock Exchange tomorrow for five years, I won't be happy owning it. I buy a farm and I don't get a quote on it for five years, and I'm happy if the farm does okay. You know, I buy an apartment house, don't get a quote on it for five years, I'm happy if the apartment house produces the returns that I expect. But people buy a stock and they look at the price the next morning and they decide whether they're doing well or not doing well. It's, it's crazy because <laughs> they're buying a piece of a business. That's what Graham, the most fundamental part of, of what he taught me. You know. You're not buying a stock, you're buying a, you're buying a part ownership in a business. You will do well if the business does well and if you didn't pay a totally silly price. And that's what it's all about. And you ought to buy businesses you understand. Just like if you're buying farms, you ought to buy farms you understand. It, it, it's, it's not complicated. But, uh, and so in calling us Graham Buffett, I mean, it's just pure Graham. I, I, I was very fortunate because I, I picked up a book when I was 19. I got interest in stocks when I was about six or seven, and I bought my first stock when I was 11, but I was playing around with all this stuff. You know, I had charts and volume, and I'm making all kinds of technical calculations and everything. And then I picked up a little book, and it just said that you're not buying some little ticker symbol that bounces around every day. You're buying, you're buying a part of a business. And as soon as I started thinking about it that way, everything else followed. It's very simple. So we buy businesses we think we can understand. There's no one here that can't understand the Coca-Cola company. I would say there's no one here that can understand some new internet company. And I said at the annual meeting this year that if I were teaching a class in business school on the final exam, I would pass out the information on an internet company and ask each student to value it. And anybody that gave me an answer, I'd flunk. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. <laughs> but people do it every day. I mean, it's more exciting. I mean, if, if, if you look at it like going to the races or something, you know, that's, that's a different thing. But if you're investing, I mean, investing is putting out money to be sure of getting more money back later, you know, at an appropriate rate. And, and to do that, you have to understand what you're doing it in. I mean, you have to understand the business. And you can understand some businesses, but not all businesses. Yep.